Hey there YouTube, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and today on WebDM we're kicking off a series on role-playing your different classes. We put out the polls on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon, you put in the votes, they have been counted and verified, so we're going to start with clerics and the role-playing aspects thereof. <laughs> All right, Jim. Yes. Now we've covered the classes before, and we've talked about the rules, all the crunch. Yes, we talked about the crunch. We, we broke down like our our take on the class abilities and sort of like what inspires us about particular classes. And we've had several rounds of class shows, and, and each time it seems like there's a part that we didn't really cover or yeah. that something others want us to, to go more in depth with. Yeah, um, one thing that I, I do love um, is role playing. Yes. I mean, not the game side of it. R-O-L-E. The, the, yeah. The, yes. Yeah, the mm -hmm. R-O-L-E side mm -hmm. of it, not mm -hmm. the R-O double hockey sticks. Sure. So let's talk about the role-playing aspects of playing a cleric. Of playing a cleric. Like, yeah. how, how to bring that to the table in whether it's realistic or unrealistic or a completely gonzo kind of way. Sure, you know. sure. Um, so what's, what's the key to setting up your cleric for, to, to properly role play them. You can't have a cleric without having a well-defined, or at least a good idea of what you want your cosmology to, to look like. Now, as a dungeon master, you can say, like, maybe there's a lot of different ideas that are rolling around in your head, and you're like, well, I, I'm not sure which one I'm gonna settle on yet. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to, to, like, start a campaign, and you're like, yeah, I don't know what exactly the relationship here is with the gods and cosmology and mortals. And you can kind of enlist, if you have a cleric player, you can enlist them and be like, hey, I'm, you know, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. But you do need to have an idea. You can't go in completely blank. You still need to right. sort of know, like, what's the ballpark where you want to end up? Yeah, I mean, there doesn't have to be eons of dogma written down, you know what I mean? Right, like, yeah. Like, it can be a little nebulous and be a little, like, <laughs> unsure about the gods. Like, yes, yeah. we do worship this thing, but it's not like there doesn't need to be a Ten Commandments. Right, <laughs> right, know? yeah. So, I, and I think that some DMs maybe feel that way. And, and, and not just about their, their cosmology and the deities and pantheons that cr they're creating for it, but they feel like that with, like, the region that they're, they're in needs to have an elaborate and, and, and well-established history. Mm -hmm. the, the NPCs that they have need to have elaborate backgrounds backstories and, and you don't you don't need that it, it can be fun and it can be enriching and rewarding to the game at some point if it if it if it becomes relevant like I said you want to have an idea a thumbnail sketch yeah right of what you want it to kind of look like and when needed you zoom in and you flesh it out and you sort of establish what the divine really looks like for your game do the gods exist are they provable uh, entities, beings that that high level characters can travel to their domains, petition them in person. They can contact them via spells. That's sort of like the Forgotten Realms, and a lot of Dungeons and Dragons is in this vein where yeah. the gods exist objectively. Yeah. They are out there. They they live on uh, you know in Forgotten Realms and other sort of baseline D and D. They live somewhere in the cosmos that corresponds most closely with their alignment. Yeah. And and therefore clear have the means and, and other devout followers of the gods have the means to talk to and, and receive advice, intercession, anything that, yeah. that you Communion. want as a DM. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then, but you also have in in uh, d d settings like Dragonlance mm -hmm. where there aren't really any gods there for a while. Yeah, right? so like the post-cataclysm, pre-War uh, of the Lance. Dragonlance does have that kind of like, the gods abandoned us, left, um, mm -hmm. clerics aren't really around. Eberron, of course, is a, is, a, is a good example of one where it's like, there are gods, people worship them, they have stories and dogma and, and tradition and all this, but no one can prove that the that they exist. Right. They um, never sent their avatars. Yeah, I mean there are celestials and everything, but it's not like Forgotten Realms where they come down into the world and exist. And and in that respect, Forgotten Realms is to me, I see it as unique in the sense that the gods are super involved in oh. the world of, of Forgotten Realms, right? Oh, yeah, they're total micromanagers. They're totally. I mean, they're like Lumberg. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm gonna need you to go ahead and come in on Sunday and worship. That'd right. be great. I'm gonna need you to launch that crusade. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. That'd Thanks. be great. You need to have that. You need to have some idea of what this is. In the same way that we were talking like warlocks, you need to know who the patron is mm -hmm. and, and what's going on. For a cleric, you need to have, you know, in order for a, a, the player of a cleric to really have a great 
understanding of, of how their character fits into your world, the DM needs to have a place for deities and the gods and, and, and things like that. And, and like I said, it doesn't need to be nailed down. Mm-hmm. It doesn't need to be absolutely fleshed out, but it does need to be like, here's what I'm thinking. You, you, know, you approach the player like, all right, here are the gods. There's seven of them. And they, these are the, the, the portfolios that they mm-hmm. cover. If the player isn't into one of those seven, they need f- the freedom to either create their own deity, create a sect of one of the existing deities that mm-hmm. more f- fits closely to their needs. You can imagine that on one of these D&D worlds that, that even, an, even a god that has a narrow focus that's like, mm-hmm. I'm the god of murder or something or whatever. <laughs> yes, I'm the god of, of revenge via murder. <laughs> right. <laughs> that there are different groups and interpretations and, and ways of seeing it so that the, the, the player has the freedom to say like, well, yeah, I, I do worship this one particular god, but I don't worship them like, say, the, the vast majority of their clergy do mm-hmm. or their or the devout followers do I, I'm as sort of a different take yeah, it's more of like a gods with benefits kind of thing as opposed right. to a true commitment so opposed to a true commitment and that's the other thing is do, does your cleric worship one god or do they worship many right well I mean that's I, I don't know that I've ever played with a cleric who worshiped more than one god like mm-hmm. worshiped like a good the good side of the pantheon right you know right. and that I think that would be pretty interesting therefore you're you're asking different gods for different spell effects based mm-hmm. Based on what it is, whether it's healing or protection right, or right. attack. Well, it, it, it leads you down this really interesting interesting path if you say, like, I'm not going to limit myself to one god. And there are several mm-hmm. ways that you can do that. You can take kind of a, a contractual obligation or sort of a contractual relationship with the gods. I, I see that sort of like the ancient Roman way, where like a lot of the prayers that we know from ancient Rome are things like, hey, if you do this for me, I'll make some sacrifices to you. Yeah. And it's very much like, do X and mm-hmm. I will give Y. Yeah. And in a, in a world like Dungeons and Dragons, where the, a mortal can gift a divine being power through belief, through devotion, through faith, that deity and sort of baseline Dungeons and Dragons gets stronger the more the more people that worship it, the more devoutly those followers worship it. Mm-hmm. That belief finds its way from the prime material through the astral into the outer planes and gives those deities power. It's how they... And that's how they become gods. And right. one of the ways that it's very difficult to kill a god is that you'd have to kill everyone that worships it as well. That worships and Keeping beliefs. it alive. Yeah. Right. You can have that kind of contractual obligation, sort of like, I'm going to make this sacrifice, go do this thing. The cleric almost kind of looks a bit like the warlock. The, the lines between warlock and cleric start to get fuzzy. But you can also go and say like, yeah, my, my cleric worships a wide variety of gods because I, I don't, I'm not exclusive. I don't, I don't need just the one god. I need, if I'm going on an ocean voyage, I pray to the god of the oceans. If I'm about to go on a fight, I pray to the goddess of battle. If I'm about to have a kid, I pray to the goddess of fertility. Like, that's what I do because they have spheres of influence. Like the end of 13th Warrior, he's like, perhaps in your land one god is, is enough. <laughs> right. We are in well, need of many. We are in need of many, yes. <laughs> shit's, shit's fucked up here. So the question then is like, how do you uh, represent that uh, with your character? You have your one domain. Mm-hmm. And in that respect, having the domains be pigeonholed, sort of like, this is war, this is trickery, this is nature, and not just like, here is a generic kind of cleric. I suppose the good domain. Yeah, I suppose life in a way sort of fulfills that because the powers of it sort of reinforce what a cleric does, support mm-hmm. uh, casting. Um, as well as sort of combat support. Cleric is a support-based class right. uh, in, in that respect. And so life kind of backs those things up. And it's not such a bad choice if you want to just sort of a generic cleric, right? Hey, I've played one and it was awesome. Right, I yeah. Mean, <laughs> especially in a, in a small party. Um, <clears throat> so when, when looking at... Um, Making your cleric. Uh-huh. Uh, Xanathars has some interesting background infos is right. in order to kind of flesh out. Help you flesh out your cleric. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, like, what, what are some of the things to, to, to consider in order to move forward and have kind of tableau to, to work off of? So, I think, like, the, the tables in the, the, the class sections of Xanathars are like each, each one gets sort of three different tables that help them flesh out the, the background for the characters. And for cleric, we have uh, a table for temples, uh, one for keepsakes, and then another for sort of secrets that you're cleric might have. I think the temple one is probably the most interesting. Um, in a way, there are a lot of parallels thematically between the cleric and the wizard mm-hmm. in that they both imply sort of instruction and a formality 
to it. Yeah. And in some ways, there's not like a divine equivalent to the sorcerer other than like a divine soul sorcerer, uh, which may be enough. That may be all we need. And they're a lot of fun, I can tell you that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, our, our last cleric show, we kind of hit on where does the divine magic come from? It, does it flow down from a god into the vessel of the cleric and then it's used? Or is the cleric already primed by some circumstance of birth mm -hmm. to be a vessel for a god and then that finds a deity to latch on to, that power that's already right. innately within them. It's almost like the uh, the other side of a magnet and you just gotta get close enough to For the two connection. to link up, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a great way of putting it because it's like there's power in both. There's obviously power in the deity but there's also power in the cleric because they have, uh, they first off, they have the ability to channel the divine magic, channel the divine energy. It's one of the things I liked most about old school D&D where it kind of really laid out, it's like first and second level cleric spells come from the cleric. And then like third and fourth level spells come from the planetars. And then like fifth level spells are from the solars. And then eventually you get up to sixth and seventh level spells. And it's like, those are from the god. Those are the big ones. Yeah, you finally get to level three tech support. Right. And you got a really bad problem. <laughs> That's when you really have yeah. a bad problem. You're tired of them telling you to turn it on and off again. <laughs> like, yeah, it's not working. Yeah. I need something more. But here's the cleric. They've, they've got this ability to, uh, to channel divine energy. They need a place to learn how to do that. They need to know the prayers. They need to know the proper gestures and vocalizations and, and and uh, scripture in order to channel the prayers which we call divine magic uh, mm -hmm. from their deity. And if you worship a whole pantheon, maybe the temple is kind of dedicated to all those gods that has like different alcoves or sections for them. If it's one deity kind of thing, or, or, or you know, if it's a collection of monotheisms <laughs> where you just sort of pick one and then go with it, then the temples might be very, very specialized and, and might even perform functions that we would normally associate with civil government. A temple to the god of the uh, god or goddess of the dead is going to serve as a, a funeral home, a mortuary, perhaps even a cemetery or a necropolis or something. It's going to provide the services of, of sort of cleaning up um, <laughs> just dead bodies uh, that are found in, in the cities or on a battlefield or something like that. Maybe it's the, the priests of a god of death who are responsible for cleaning up battlefields, who are responsible for going door to door during times of plague and collecting bodies, mm -hmm. or for just like caring for the dying. So a, god, or a temple of the god of the dead might also be a hospice, right? Like these are people right. who are on their way out and need a safe and smooth transition because we do not want these people to have a traumatic death so they come back as ghosts and shit. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that because that, that's a bad time for everyone, right? It's a very I mean, bad time for everyone. You have everyone. a breakout of ghosts or banshees or, or whatever, you, right. you know. A god or goddess of sort of hearth and home, uh, the domestic arts, they run like a soup kitchen or, or something like that. They're responsible for, for feeding the poor in a city mm -hmm. or something. A god of the harvest. One of the things I like most about Forgotten Realms is the place called uh, Greenfields, which is like this giant temple agricultural complex to Shantea, I think, the mm -hmm. goddess of, of, uh, of sort of fertility and the harvest and wheat and everything. And it's a year round massive farm tended to by druids and treants and dryads and all this other stuff and it's basically the bread basket for big cities like Waterdeep. Um, and, and it's, but it's a temple, right? It's, it's where the goddess sort of invests part of her power and mm -hmm. her priests are sort of established there. So thinking about your character's temple, what does it look like? What place does it have in the world? What, what function does it serve? Before you became an adventurer, what was your role within that organization? Right. Were you a mendicant priest that traveled from village to village offering um, sacraments and, and, and an opportunity to worship for the, for mm -hmm. the common folk? Uh, or were you secluded? You know, you entered your, your temple and it's more like a monastery and the doors right. are shut. You didn't come out until you decided to go adventuring for some reason. Neil Stevenson's uh, Anathema is a great example. It's a great example yeah. of these cloistered, you know, monasteries. Mm -hmm. and they, don't, they only open the gates every 10 years or something. Right. Shit. And, and what a great example of like a, the way that a, a clergy of, say, a knowledge cleric might operate, yeah. right? That they are so devoted to knowledge, the preservation of knowledge, the discovery of new things, the, you know, the recording of what was discovered in the past. Uh, that maybe they do take kind of a scientific approach to it. And mm -hmm. maybe uh, a, a temple dedicated to knowledge clerics looks more like a university yeah. than it would uh, a traditional sort of place of worship. But there are still things like, okay, well you, first off, you know, like, take like candle keep, right? There's no fire allowed in this place. Like everything, every, e every, ma every light is magical light. Mm -hmm. There is no fire allowed here. Is there a place or something to, to 
copy uh, texts that you bring in, some place that you can engage in sort of divination magic. Maybe uh, maybe they have a collection of magic mirrors and crystal balls and other scrying uh, mm -hmm. implements that you can use. Because then that temple becomes a resource for the cleric player. Right, right. They can return to it, assuming that they weren't kicked out or something like yeah. that. To further, um, you know, the, the history of your cleric, I mean, maybe your cleric was a criminal. And, he right. was, and it's kind of like a uh, taking the black thing. It's like, well, mm -hmm. you can go and live a life of, in the monastery. Right. Or you're going to go to prison. And nobody wants to go to prison. So, okay, I went over to the monastery and then actually uh, I kind of like it, Eric. You find peace. You find you inner peace. become a cleric. Right. You know? right. But that'd be a way to do a cleric with a criminal background. But, and you could do that with, like, say, you have a deity of, like, law and justice and something like that. And that's what those priests offer those that they, that they convict. It's mm -hmm. like, well, we have two options for you. You can either serve your time in our clergy. You can take the oath. You can become, a, you can become an acolyte. Um, and and sort of, that's one way out. Uh, or you can go to the prison that we maintain. That gives an opportunity. And then uh, that cleric player can create a custom background, maybe a blend of criminal and acolyte, something like that. Right, right. And really sort of embed their character in the world that the dungeon master has created, making a space for themselves and keeping it interesting, keeping it engaged and not just be like, oh yeah, I have some divine powers, I can heal, I've got spirit guardians, that's a really cool spell. Mm -hmm. Something beyond just like the button pushing, character ability, sort of where you start with a character, it's just like, I've got this stuff, where your background fits into the world, what, what does it mean to be a cleric? How does mm -hmm. that look in the day-to-day -day life when you're not battling undead or healing your party up after a big fight? Thinking about those things can provide depth and, and uh, a sense of place to the to where you're adventuring. Everybody should just watch Mash uh, with Hawkeye Pierce. Okay, yeah. if you want to know like the way to play a cleric, that's uh -huh. not. I mean, yeah, he heals everybody, but he's also kind of a selfish asshole, and he right. chases nurses. A cleric that is like that. He yes. can heal. He is a vessel for for healing. Mm -hmm. But you know, he's got some flaws too. He's got some flaws. Creating a flawed uh, a, a priest is an interesting thing because mm -hmm. I think the tendency is to be like, well, I know my character is a, a priest, they're a cleric. Mm -hmm. they've, they've, they're so devout that, that a god has invested some of their energy, some of their divine energy into them, they couldn't possibly be flawed. And you can play one where it's like, oh no, I'm not flawed and they're sort of like this holier than thou, except they're not, yeah. right? They just sort of maintain this facade. Right, but right. I think it's really interesting to play a cleric that's like really bad. Where's it on sleeve? Yeah, like a coward war cleric, or like you're saying like a hard living life cleric. Like, or like Thoros of Mir? Yes. He just gets drunk all the time. Right. He's just he, a cleric that's given up. But yeah. He still is casting these spells and he's mm -hmm. kind of confused. And kind uh, of confused. And so then it, it, it really does reinforce the fact, a, a reluctant cleric, right? Like, I don't want this. I, 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 I'm, I, don't, I can do these things, I don't want this, but I've, yet the burden still falls to me. Right. Um, and, and that allows for depth and complexity in creating engaging characters that, that have room to grow. Mm -hmm. Right, like that's what we're really looking for, and and hopefully the, these this new class, series of class shows will will let our, our viewers know that the most important thing for their characters is that, that they start somewhere and end up different, not just in terms of their power, but in terms of how their characters think about things, what their reactions are, what their beliefs are, yeah. what 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 things that they hold dear. Yeah, you can start as sort of a naive novice cleric whose whose time and training is over. They've learned everything they can. First off, they're like the only person in their class that can cast spells, right? Because like 90% of, <laughs> of priests are not clerics, right? They're just CR0 peasants with the acolyte background. <laughs> yeah, maybe one or two of them were lucky enough to take the magic initiate feat. Sure, maybe. And they have a couple of things. And, and through years and years of practice, yeah. they can cast a spell. Yeah. Right. But but for the cleric, you are someone who excels at that. And what does that mean for yourself in the priesthood? Are you cho once it's once your power is revealed and and, and that you are you can channel divine energy and that the prayers you offer uh, to the gods are answered it, directly through spells? Does that mean that you're plucked out uh, of the priesthood and sent somewhere else? And mm -hmm. it's like, oh yeah, there's all those priests and they're trained in nature they're trained in religion and and maybe history and they know the prayers yeah. and maybe through long and careful study uh, they can help with a ritual or learn a couple of cantrips but these people over here the gods answer their prayers yeah. with magic 
and every day, every day, and it, without fail, they're special. And 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 perhaps it's one of those things where even in a highly structured hierarchical priesthood, the fact that a character can cast spells means that they get a free pass for some things. Everybody else is over here having to go through the, the bullshit. The priest is over there in the gifted and talented class getting to play games and... Yeah, they actually get, still get nap time after <laughs> they still get whatever the nap great. time, right. <laughs> um, so Jim, we've kind of talked about typical clerics and, and how to play, but when you really want to play against type, like uh -huh. like could you do a cleric that doesn't worship a god? I mean, I think you could, right? Like there's there's the sidebar in Xanathar's about clerics who follow a pan whole pantheon or a philosophy or, or even just a cosmic force. Really what we've got with the with a, a cleric is someone who believes in something, mm -hmm. something greater than themselves, something um, uh, transcendent. And they believe in it to such an extent that their faith in that thing is what powers them. That, that a cleric is really, really the class, not so much even about like paladins, even though paladins are sort of a divine class um, and use divine magic, their power is more about the oath that they swear to an ideal. Whereas the cleric is about like the faith that they have in this transcendent force. And so you could have a cleric who's like, yeah, the gods, some, they, they, they are something. Mm -hmm. Those beings that live in the outer planes and whose corpses litter the, the astral sea, they're something. But to call them gods is to give them more credit than they have. They didn't create this place. They right, didn't right. create us. In fact, in, in I think the way I kind of take it in baseline Dungeons and Dragons, the gods are created by mortals. That, at least that's how I, I kind of see it. So it's like, you might have a cleric that looks at all that and goes, there's something greater than even the gods. Mm -hmm. And whatever presence, being, force, whatever that is, has yet to reveal itself. But I don't worship these gods. They're charlatans or, or maybe it's like, yeah, I acknowledge their power, mm -hmm. but not their divinity. Uh, the Athar in Planescape, the Defilers, a faction in Planescape, basically holds this view that they live in the, the great planar city of, I know it's called Sigil, or sorry, it's called Sigil, but I call it Sigil because it's pronounced Sigil. Um, anyway, that's just an aside. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they sort of live there, and and they're so just open a door to uh, people are going to be upset. I pronunciation is a fuzzy thing for me. So if you're curious about like playing a cleric that doesn't believe in gods, check out that faction in Planescape. There's there's places planeswalker.net I believe is one uh, where you can find a pl thing like that, or mm -hmm. just check out Planescape uh, online and and uh, look for them. But I think you definitely could have a, a cleric that sort of is just like yeah, I'm a cleric of my domain. I'm a cleric of war. I don't yeah. worship a specific war god. I just, I study and, and am involved in war. And you want me on your side if you're going to engage in war. Like, mm -hmm. I just know it. And maybe they're a, a general's advisor or, or something like that, but they don't have like a specific god that yeah. they go and work, talk to. More of the, the, the power that is created by the clash of armies and life is being taken and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and saved and there's a lot of energy flowing around and they just know how to harness that. They just know how to harness that and they can see the, the waves of fear and panic on a battlefield. Uh, they read a battlefield like a map mm -hmm. and know exactly where to go, exactly what to do. Um, those are the kinds of things that you can, you can use to portray uh, your character, not just the magic they have, not just the channel divinity powers that they have, but like their attitude, their approach to things can be rooted in their belief and their faith and, and maybe provide them a certainty. That said, creating a character that has flaws, creating a character that has, um, that, that maybe something triggers a, a crisis of faith for them and, and going, playing through that, whether it's a particularly nasty villain that the party just can't come to grips with yeah. and, and, and frustrates them and, and they're driven to extreme lengths to defeat the enemy and that triggers something in, in the cleric or something that the DM throws at them. Like maybe the cleric's walking around going like, yeah, the gods are real and I talk to the servants of the deities all day long. And then over the course of the campaign, it is revealed that that is a sham. That something that something's happening, and yet that cleric still casting spells. There's nothing has happened to that cleric personally, but they now have to grapple with this change in what they believed and what that means for them. That could be something that's fun. Talk about an existential crisis. Go ahead, and, <laughs> go ahead and let that drop on your head. And maybe not everybody's D and D is 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 ready for existential crises like that. But I, they can be fun, and and it's it's sometimes fun to just like throw them at your players, and if they pick it up and run with it, great. If they don't, no sweat. You just move on to the next thing. Like, what about a cleric who's like, my god is myself. Like, I am a god. Mm -hmm. And you can't deny it, 
because I've got the power. It gives you an opportunity to do something weird mm -hmm. and off the wall. I'm a cleric of myself. It's definitely, if, you're, if you've played a couple of clerics and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm tired of being a cleric who, who belongs to this formal temple, who worships this formal god. Mm -hmm. um, well, I want to try something different then the cleric who worships themselves uh, is, is one of those. That the cleric that walks in town, who do you worship? I worship Narcia. What's yeah. your name? My name is Narcia. Yeah, I am the god. <laughs> um, and, I, and maybe that works more for a divine soul sorcerer, right? Like, you can see that uh, that sort of archetype fitting with either mm -hmm. of the two classes. I thought about doing that for Elvadine. Yeah. But <laughs> I was just like, eh. You didn't want, didn't feel like. So, so the gods aren't there. It's like, yeah, I'm the, I, I I've am, returned. I've returned. It's okay, guys. I just wanted I'm to back. look around and be like, <laughs> fuck this. <laughs> but creating characters that are that are flawed, kind of return to that one, is partly why that secrets table exists in Xanathar's Guide. That there's a dark secret. One of the entries on there, I think, is like an, an imp occasionally advises you. And what if it is one of those things where you've got a you know a particularly devout cleric of a good deity? Then that that cleric might have to deal with devils sending uh, tempters and corruptors at them constantly. These are NPCs that the that the DM introduces who are never supposed to be for combat. Maybe that's an imp. Maybe it's a succubus. Maybe it's a, some other type of devil or even demon that's attempting to mm -hmm. to trick and and trap and and uh, and corrupt this cleric but that they just constantly have to deal with it. Maybe this imp situation is like, every time a decision comes up in the campaign, you have the DM going, yeah, this, this imp's reminding you of all the different ways you could abuse your power, mm -hmm. and all the different ways you could take more for yourself, and all the different ways you could be self-serving, and tempt them, you know, make them, break their, make them break their bonds, make them go against their ideals, make them give in to their flaws. That's what those role-playing personality quirks are there for, is you can kind of like use those things to tempt your clerics, mm -hmm. to offer them things that you know the players want, yeah. right? That's another great way. It's, it's metagaming on the DM's part. I am yeah. going to play to my players what they want, but it's gonna have an impact in the game. And that's one That's one of those where I see like metagaming is a good thing. Metagaming is one of those things that's a tool to use to create engaging uh, sessions. Well, yeah, I mean, unless, you're, unless your player uh, writes out an entire like uh, psychological profile on their character and the DM actually reads it, <laughs> All you really have are the players at your Just table and what you know about them personally. Right. Right. And so there's, I don't see any problem with metagaming in that way, like you said. Just like offer them something, you yeah. know? Yeah, if you, if, you, if you have a player who you know likes certain, say, magic items or likes certain powers and abilities mm -hmm. or wants a certain thing for their character, then offer it to them in a very easy way that will become morally compromising later. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a good way to sort of like introduce a flawed character. And then they, they, again, now the character has room to grow. They can re seek to redeem themselves. They can give in to their corruption and that offers the player a choice uh, if they do take the bait. If they don't take the bait, great. Then they've reinforced the fact that their character is a mm -hmm. devout and virtuous uh, uh, cleric. They've walked through the fires of temptation and are left unscathed. Right, and the next time uh, you just ump up the ante yeah. and, and send more. And then eventually maybe you, you get towards things where they're like, well now someone's coming after the cleric to plane shift you to hell, where you'll be taken in and, and corrupted that way. They tried to do it the nice way, mm -hmm. now they're gonna do it the hard way. And um, well, that's how adventures happen. Uh, you're, damn, <laughs> you're damn right. <laughs> <clears throat> oh boy, uh, here we go. How does my have we been rolling? rolling? Have we been rolling the whole time? No. The whole time? Well, kind of. But not like this. <laughs> not really rolling. Not like this. Not, not, like, this. not like this. Not like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun. <clears throat> Never again. <sighs> That's not great. Every time. You don't have to lie to me. <laughs> every time, always. <laughs> okay, Jim, you about ready? No, I'm not ready. I'm, 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 we should start, but I'm not. I'm not gonna feel ready. Like until seriously, probably this is, like I'm two. like I'm like fucking radar over here. Yeah. <sighs> Surprised I can see. I find myself punchy today. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just trying to keep my shit together, man. Okay. <clears throat>
Ready? Yeah. 